You know, look, the Assange case has completely fallen apart. Uh, when you have when, when there when there is witness tampering, as soon as that happens, any great team will figure out a way to at least in a just system, of course, would figure out a way to just get the case tossed. Attorney, please speak. Share your thoughts on that. Uh, you know, this is something that I, it, it's not even remotely surprising because the people that are um, in the know on this know that the case against Assange was bogus. And we know that there isn't any evidence that he is the person who encouraged Chelsea Manning or helped her hack into the system or do anything. And that's what they're trying to get. Um, so obviously, whoever it is that they had as a witness or that they used as a witness to say that this is something that there was evidence of, they weren't able to find it. But right. those of us who know are not surprised at all because there is no evidence because that didn't happen. So yeah, I, I mean, it's gonna gradually unravel, but this also might be a way that they're gonna do it and sort of save face. Now it'll be like, okay, it's not that we're going to drop the charges against Assange. It's that, oh, wow, it wasn't really that, you know. So yeah. this is a way for the case to go away. They see that the, they see the writing on the wall with this. This is a way for it to go away without them looking like total hacks. Yeah, so that's the what it looks like. Do is they're just going to throw the, they're basically trying to throw this, you know. I mean, this guy, like we talked about the other day, is probably, you know, a CIA witness who just, um, you know, he's a spook. He just gives them information and, you know, keeps tabs on different people. And they wanted to use him as a means to, you know, getting to Assange. And uh, and again, this happens all the time. You know, there's all different types of nefarious yeah. people that commit various crimes. And, you know, our shadow government takes them under their wing and basically says, look, you're going to work for us and you're going to get us information or we're going to take you down. And so. I guess from this guy's perspective, uh, I think he's we he's from you know he's from uh, Scandinavia and basically was like all right I'll give you whatever you want to hear basically, you know they they had that scene in uh, the Godfather Part Two when Pantangeli is testifying and he says I made up some stuff for the FBI and they wanted to believe this and that and the truth is that's just kind of how it happens you know they make up a bunch of stuff so they don't have to go down because again Assange has completely you know, peeled the mask off of our deep state in many ways. And yeah. I'm not saying that there aren't a lot of people who just are, it's kind of like, there's a lot of people in this country who follow politics and just accept the system as it is. And they just don't want to rock the boat. But they while we're know. speaking of Assange people, people, if you haven't done it yet, please call the Department of Justice comment line. Yeah. Um, we will, uh, it's probably not there because we weren't necessarily planning for this, but we do have a script that is available and it is attached to a couple of other videos. When we, when we put this up, I'll put it on there. But guys, all you have to do, call the Department of Justice comment line, tell the Attorney General, tell a Merrick Garland to drop the case against Julian Assange that we do not want them to pursue this case. It's really very easy. It's leaving a message, say your name, where you're from, say, please do not prosecute Julian Assange. Speaking you know, of so if you haven't done it, please do it. Speaking of leaving messages, and even though it's not part of our news and amuse, I mean, we could talk about her pretty much every show, but Kirsten Cinema, we all know what a horrific reputation. No, she, she is had. part of our story. She's part of story time tonight. Oh, okay. Well, she's in that group that's involved in story time. Yeah, but here's the thing: this is not part of story time. This is something else that came out today. Oh. It's not really surprising, though. She has a horrific reputation as a senator uh, in, in regards to her staff. Uh, she treats her staff like absolute dog crap. And that's not, again, it's not surprising. It's pretty much expected in many ways. Uh. But even some of the worst representatives don't necessarily have a reputation of not dealing well with their subordinates. And the fact that she, on top of everything else, treats her workers terribly Hey, listen, I, in, in a lot of ways, I don't have any sympathy. I really don't because she's a manufactured candidate of all of the wine moms around the country who yeah, were hell bent no, on terrible. getting. Like, this is why, like, I don't like to yeah. talk about it because I don't like to give it publicity. So wh why are, why are you adding know, this? But I just hope that she is a, I just hope that she becomes more or less, you know, the poster child for uh, you have to vet the candidates properly. And you also have to recognize that corporate special interest money behind candidates is going to become a problem. Well, it, no hasn't, it hasn't been a problem for Joe Manchin and it might not be a problem for her. So we'll see. 
Well, not as of now, but the more we keep building the movement, the more people are not going to tolerate this crap. And that's something we could, and that's theoretically something we could talk about with Mike and Julie when they come on. So as it relates to one of the more significant issues, you know, a lot of people on the conservative side like to talk about what is known as the Great Reset, which is this idea that basically the bailout money was done specifically to get the multinational corporations, all of the loot, and screw over all of the small businesses throughout the country. And so what you're seeing now are these massive, uh, you know, scoops from organizations like BlackRock that are buying homes, you know, at ad nauseum, if you will, all over the country. And so this particular article, which is from Vox, not a surprise, Wall Street isn't to blame for the chaotic housing market. That's funny. Who would have thought that Wall Street would not have anything to do with why people can't afford to buy a house anymore? There is this idea, this notion that we're becoming a serfs class. It's not a notion. It's reality. Most people can't afford to buy a house that are in the you know, millennial and Gen Z generation. And that's a serious problem. And when you have corporate media that are willing to put out articles suggesting that the the actual problem isn't the actual problem, what do you call that? How is that not propaganda of the worst kind? We know who the perpetrators are, and yet they're putting out articles saying, no, it's not actually them. <laughs> well, what would you expect when the same company that owns those interests owns the media? <laughs> it's, just, it's just all the same thing. <clears throat> yeah, the and again, uh, I feel terribly for a lot of people who just don't know any better. I don't think that they're ill-intended. But well, I also we're going to get into this a lot more in detail when Jordan's on because the housing crisis, um, as soon as the eviction moratorium is let up, is going to reach astronomical uh, sizes. Oh, when it's going we're to happen. Talking about 30, we're talking like upwards of 30 million homeless. Yeah, it's going to happen. It's just a question of when it happens. Yeah. Now, do I think that they have it in them? to basically try to delay it until the midterms. Um, they're going to try, but I don't think it'll last that long because there's too much money being lost and they don't want that. That's why they're buying up all these homes because I think what they're going to do is they're going to basically just turn everything into rental properties and that's all anybody's going to be able to afford and be able to get. So they're going to have no equity. They're not going to be able to build any type of wealth. It's, and, it's just another, it's another tool to keep a permanent underclass. That's all. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I definitely agree with that. And again, the problem just gets worse every day. Uh, and it's not going to get better before enough people are willing to put on that yellow vest, as you like to say, you know, until there comes a point where people just are not going to take it anymore. Uh, who the heck knows, you know, how much uh, people are going to be willing to take. But I think when they start mass kicking, you know, the, the, like a mass of kicking people out of their homes, then it's really going to get bad. Like it's going to well, get very bad. People are already having issues in different cities where they're out protesting that there's homeless encampments at their neighborhoods because mm -hmm. they don't want to be walking their kids to school and having to step over human waste. So eventually when you're getting upwards 20 million or so homeless people, that's going to start to impact more and more people that aren't homeless. So it's it's going to be really interesting to me how this is going to go down, because usually people don't care about things until it affects them. So we'll, we'll see. But there are a lot of people protesting right now against their municipalities for not handling the homeless situation better. And, you know, I don't know exactly what the, if they I gotta, what their suggestions are. But uh, I got to I got to say, though, how is Jimmy Dore and swearing his violence on the the live stream at the same time? I thought I they were know. the same person. I think they're the same person. I don't know. I don't think they I don't think they are able to do that. But guys, smash the like button, share. We need everybody watching on YouTube. We got a lot of important things to cover tonight. Let's talk about and do you see do you see the pictures on the other articles? I see the bombs being dropped for Do you see the picture on the person? Oh, two face. Yeah. Oh yeah, he is two. Well, he is two face. Well, but I don't even think but but Joe doesn't even know you know what what his he doesn't even recognize his own face. Like Joe is so out of sight, out of mind. I know. Days. I know. It's, 
I mean, but again, the reality is he's been playing this thing, this duality with foreign policy since the minute he got in there and whether or not it's him or whoever his little handlers are or whoever is actually in charge at the military industrial complex. But they're creating this situation where they're trying to give a little in one place, but it just looks absolutely ridiculous when put up against what's going on. So they're wanting they're wanting to have peace talks in Afghanistan and have troop withdrawal. But at the same time, he's airstriking in Iraq, Syria border. So like, I, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. What, and and what, again, what is the goal what's, here? Even more, what's even more interesting is that he drops these bombs the day Mike Gravel passes away. I mean, it's just so, uh, but in a way it's so honest about where we stand when it comes to war policy and that there can never be enough. Yeah. But I like in, in a lot of ways, you know, I don't harp on it too much, but I fully believe that, you know, our, our president has some form of onset dementia. Oh, and, I do too. And, and they don't want to talk about that and they don't want to. But, and, but and it doesn't but, matter. But here's, but here's the big problem. You know, when, when I think of Reagan, for example, Reagan is one of the most polarizing presidents we've ever had because he had one of the most successful first terms any president has ever had. And he had one of the worst second terms any president ever had. You know, Dukakis was heading for a landslide victory against Bush until he completely messed up on the debate stage. It's amazing how if you have a really bad debate performance, that can absolutely sink your campaign. I'm telling you, no, and, it was the friggin' helmet in the tank. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, that helmet on his head. And he it, it was it was just so bad. Um it the was reason just I'm really referencing bad. the reason I'm referencing Reagan in comparison to Biden. It's because they're both out to lunch. If you look at the way Reagan debated Carter in 1980 versus the way he debated Mondale in 1984, you're looking at two completely different people. Now that you have a president, again, who isn't really in charge, who isn't really making decisions, it allows for people behind the scenes to do these nefarious things. I, I think that it would happen regardless. I, I I believe that the trajectory is the trajectory, regardless of who's sitting in the Oval Office, when you're dealing with people that are part of the corporate establishment. It no, doesn't matter who it are, is. No, I don't agree with that because I think there are times where presidents will stand up to some degree. I mean- When have you seen that last? Well, I think there were instances where Trump really didn't want to be in any type of a bomb. But he situation. didn't do anything about it. And we're still on the same trajectory and the things are still happening. The wheels are still churning. So, I, again, I don't think it matters who's sitting there. They're all beholden to the military industrial complex and this stuff. The only difference is, is which stories get bigger placement in the news. I think that's the variable depending well, on what they're trying well, to make. It's it no, well, like. it's, you know what? In a way, it's no different than what. What you know took place with the uh, with the New York Times or the Washington Post, where they said, "Where now that Trump is out of the White House, we're not covering, you know, the president every day right. anymore." I mean, right. how could you be so transparently corrupt, so brazenly? And you no, know, you, you're not supposed to have a bias. That's not supposed to exist. The smaller papers, maybe, but even then, it's not good. Because it's freedom of the press. You're really supposed to be giving an objective perspective, not a biased perspective. But they don't, they, they stopped. That was so long ago. Like they're not even actual journalists anymore at all. They don't do any investigative reporting. So no, what, they're, they're, what is they're, it they're, they're going to find out? Not, but you know, again, this is the reason why I, I harp on this idea that while I do think that there are a lot of things to be left to be desired when it comes to, you know, the squad and, and different, um, you know, factions that are, building, if you will, of the non-corporate left or just non-corporate in general, it doesn't even have, to, even have to be the left. They make up 5% of, of Capitol Hill. You know, how many people out there are on the corporate dollar? You know, our congressional representative, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, may be one of the worst, but there are a hell of a lot more. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.